Hello. Thank you for the very kind invitation to present to you today at the TWIST uh, event, Writing the Future in Asia Pacific. In light of this ambitious focus of the talks, I'm going to present a slightly more provocative title than normal about increasing the precision, precision medicine for children with high-risk cancer. My name is Mark Cowley. I'm based at the Children's Cancer Institute in Sydney, Australia, and today I'll be presenting on behalf of the Zero Childhood Cancer Program. And I'll tell you a whole lot more about that today. Again, given the, the ambitious scope of today, I, I thought let's, let's change the introduction. So if we're going to write the future, imagine if every child and young person with cancer could be enrolled in a precision medicine program. Imagine if every child could have their tumour monitored in real time to accurately stage each tumour, monitor their relapse in real time and change their treatment dynamically for, for better or for worse. Imagine if every patient's treatment could be informed by all of those before. I guess that's the nice uh, scope for some of the things that we've been trying to do in the Zero Childhood Cancer Program and some of the things I'd like to tell you about today. Before I do that, some fast facts. I realise not everyone online will be a, a childhood cancer expert. So at least in Australia, there are about 950 children and adolescents diagnosed with cancer every single year. So and about three will die every week from their cancer. Thanks to decades of, of excellent uh, research, 80% um, of children do survive their treatment, but unfortunately many of those patients still suffer long-term side effects from often the, the toxic treatments that they undergo. And still there are a number of childhood cancer subtypes that are, are extremely difficult to treat, uh, difficult to diagnose, and are otherwise um, uh, have, have adverse outcomes from their, their disease. So fundamentally, we think about cancer as being a disease of the genome. Here on the left, we see a normal diploid cell down the microscope. These are sky fish uh, images, each, each chromosome paired up. But then in the middle, down the sky fish microscope, we see the extensive level of genome aberrations that can happen in cancer. Here you see zero intact copies of chromosome 2, triplication of chromosome 3, four copies of 10. And what becomes even more scary are these marker chromosomes, which are different chromosomes fused together in different combinations. Uh, with whole genome sequencing over here on the right, I'm showing a circular view of the same sort of data where we can see each of these dots represents a single nucleotide variation in the tumour. These green blocks are amplifications, the red ones deletions, and all these lines in the middle represent structural variants or these marker chromosomes, just revealing the extent of genomic instability that underlies most, uh, most cancers. Using whole genome sequencing, we can reveal that most patients are born with about 5 million genetic differences compared to the reference genome. Of course, most of those are going to be benign, but most uh, patients with cancer acquire 10 to 100,000 additional mutations in their tumour. Some of the children that we've sequenced have millions of somatic mutations accumulated in their tumour. And so this is the lens that we take, I was trying to understand these genetic changes to see if any of this can inform why the patient got their disease and whether we can use that information to treat these patients better. It's really important to, to pause and say that each patient's genome is unique, even within the same cancer type. So one of the most deadly childhood brain cancers is called diffuse intrinsic pontine glioma. Uh, universally fatal at the moment, very few new treatments. Um, about five to eight months is, is the life expectancy upon getting a diagnosis of DIPG. We know about some really important mutations like the histone K27M mutation, ACVR1, P53, and PDGFRA. But beyond those big mutations, when you look at the genome profiles, as I'm showing you here on the left, those genomes are quite genomically stable, very few copy number and structural variations. But on the right, a high level of genomic instability. This is just one of the ways of showing the heterogeneity that exists within different cancer types. And I think we can all see the writing on the wall that unless we understand this heterogeneity, we can use this to, uh, to devise better treatments or at least understand which patients are at higher or lower risk. So again, I know we have a fairly broad audience, so it's worth pausing at this moment and talking about what is precision cancer medicine 
And really it's the realisation that we're shifting from a, a, a single treatment based on the, the, the location of the tumour to using as many different modalities to try and understand them, the genetic and molecular basis of each of those tumours. Today that means lots of genome and RNA sequencing, methylation profiling, trying to work out which patients are going to respond to immunotherapy is a large unanswered challenge at the moment, and how we match all that information to come up with the best possible treatment strategy for each patient. Hopefully that will lead to more cures, less long-term health impacts from the cytotoxic treatments. So most of today's talk is really framed about precision medicine, how we've been doing it so far, and how we think we can start to do this in the future. So Zero Childhood Cancer is Australia's national paediatric cancer precision medicine program. We launched in about 2015 with a pilot study that recruited about 58 children uh, at the time. And then we launched our national program in 2017, which has already recruited over 450 children from all eight hospitals around Australia. And at the moment, we've been focusing on children with high risk or relapse cancer or rare cancers. So these are the children that are really hard to diagnose, uh, have very few treatment options either when they're diagnosed or who have failed through every line of standard treatment therapy that, that exists and so currently have no more treatment options available to them. Ultimately, I guess spoiler alert, is that we've just been funded by our federal government is that to expand the program not just to the high-risk children, which is about 150 children per year, to all 1,000 children that will be newly diagnosed, such that by 2023, every single child in the country will be eligible for enrolment onto the Zero Childhood Cancer Program, where they'll receive, as, as all the patients so far have received, whole genome sequencing, of the tumour and the germline, RNA sequencing of the tumour, methylation profiling of the tumour, and where possible, high throughput drug screening, patient derived xenograft screening, and ultimately making uh, improvements to their clinical, uh, clinical treatments back in the hospital. So, pretty ambitious program. That means a scaling up over the next couple of years eightfold on the basis of some of the results that I'm going to be showing you today. So I'm a computational biologist, and so I think about these core computational biology challenges of precision medicine, and that is that each patient is born with about five million genetic variants, and the question is which zero, one or two of these increase their risk if we take a monogenic view on risk, which we do at the moment. I've already mentioned that each tumour requires a thousand to a million additional genetic variants, hundreds of dysregulated genes, and dozens of pathways get affected. Which of these are actually medically relevant and could be used to understand why the patient got their disease and understand how to treat these patients better? We try and do this in real time. We have about a median of seven week turnaround from a patient being enrolled, doing all this molecular profiling and putting those pieces back together into a treatment plan for each individual. And I'm gonna show you lots of different examples of how we, we bring these different data types together throughout today's talk. I'm reminded when I talk to cytogeneticists that uh, careful what you wish for. When you have all these amazing technologies feeding you lots of data, you're obliged to look at all these different types of mutation categories from single nucleotide changes, copy number variation, structural variation, looking at tumor mutation burdens, signatures, clonality. Dozens and dozens of different features need to be unpacked quite quickly uh, to try and work out which of this information actually matters for the patient. And of course, this information is, remains for, for research and discovery purposes. Um, but yeah, that's our challenge is to put all this together for each patient in real time. Ultimately, data integration is key. We take a patient-focused view, we integrate their germline molecular findings, somatic mutation signatures, how the RNA-seq contributes to the, the, the information from the genome and take the clinical history of the patient to put all of this, this puzzle together. So enough about the background, here's a case in point. Um, here is a case, uh, an example of an 11 month girl who on the top left you can see was enrolled with a tumor the size of her chest. Um, the clinicians thought it might be infantile fibrosarcoma, but the pathology laboratory could not find the, the diagnostic mutation for that cancer type. So she remained undiagnosed and untreated or, or on chemo, which she did not do well with. 
In a space of nine days, we were able to enroll this child onto the study, sequenced her genome extremely rapidly, analyze her data using our cloud-based pipeline, and come up with a personalized genome profile such that you see on the, on the left there. When we looked into the data, what we found was a novel N-track fusion, where the, the three prime partner, five prime partner was SPEC1L, and the three prime was, was N-track3. So this combination of two genes had never been seen before. It's, it's understandable why the pathology lab didn't find this genetic change, but it did confirm the diagnosis of infantile fibrosarcoma because of this N-track fusion. The reason I'm really telling you about this example is that this, this discovery allowed us to make a novel treatment recommendation, and I believe this patient was the first to receive the brand new uh, uh, drug, larotrectinib, developed by Loxo Oncology. And in a space of two short weeks, the tumor visibly started to shrink. This was a couple of years ago, and this patient's now uh, doing remarkably well, tumor-free, and, um, and has had a great response. We've since found two other cases with this SPEC1L N-TRAC fusion in a variety of different cancers, cloned the fusion, proved it's pathogenic, and ended up publishing that. So I like this story because it tells us about the importance of the diagnosis. Sometimes that leads to a treatment, and what I didn't say before is that this drug was only just available a couple of weeks before this patient got diagnosed. So it tells you how fast the, um, the pharmaceutical industry is developing new, new compounds as well. So all those pieces came together remarkably uh, for this particular patient and many since uh, with the same similar types of N-track fusions. So larotrectinib is I hope many of you have heard about it. I, I, every time I present, not everyone has. So, so this slide really is, is just to let you know a bit more about larotrectinib. It's a very specific uh, inhibitor of NTRAC 1, 2, and 3. And this waterfall plot in the middle shows that most of the patients that received the drug had tumor shrinkage. And the colors of those bars tell you that it did not matter what cancer type they actually had. So this was uh, one of the very first examples of the FDA approving an anti -targeted, a, a targeted anti-cancer drug based on patients that have the mutation rather than on a particular cancer type. And so this is uh, the way of the future, I believe. Um, we were the, none of these bars was in the brain cancer. And so in another patient, we were able to uh, be, I believe, the first in the world to, to treat a patient with glioblastoma with this particular drug. Here, the NTV6 NTRAC3 is a more common type of NTRAC fusion. And after eight weeks of treatment, the patient had a remarkable response uh, to, to this particular therapy. Unfortunately, about 14 months later, the patient did relapse, uh, but there's still a remarkable success and almost certainly extended the life in a way that would not have been possible otherwise. So in a nutshell, from the first 247 patients that we've enrolled onto the Zero Childhood Cancer Program, we were able to find far higher rates of clinical information than we ever thought possible, really. In 94% of patients, we found a reportable finding, which is a driver mutation that explains the tumour. 71% of patients received a treatment recommendation. 16% uh, of patients had an inherited genetic predisposition which I'm going to talk more about each of these circles coming up. 5% of the cases we changed the diagnosis, which is obviously critical for managing them. And really, the 71% of patients who took the targeted treatment recommendation had a response. I'm going to tell you all about these different factors going forward. So um, if we put all this together, uh, starting at the 94% of patients that had a reportable finding, if we look at the 30 top genes that we've reported, you can see that from the colors that there's a, just a diverse array of different alterations driving these tumors, from biallelic deletion, single nucleotide changes, activating structural variants, a whole gamut of different types of mutations driving all of these different genes. This is really important because in pediatric cancers, most of the genetic changes are structural variations, such as fusions, which can be missed if you're only looking for single nucleotide changes. Um, when we looked at this data, there were 101 known or novel driver fusions identified across the cohort. So just reinforcing the importance of looking for structural variation in childhood cancer. This figure reveals two of the, the clinically uh, actionable fusions, uh, an EGFR fusion 
and a FGFR1 fusion. Um, on the left, you see the genome profile with often in the top left has about a dozen different structural variant breakpoints. This looks like an example of chromothripsis that ended up driving this EGFR CLIP2 fusion. The bottom left is a slightly simpler example, but still, you know, about a dozen different structural variant breakpoints that ended up driving this FGFR1 fusion. So this, I guess the point is that when you bring the genome and the RNA-seq together, we're revealing a whole range of complicated genetic events, far more than the textbook would have you believe about reciprocal translocations like the BCR ABLE that, that we all know well and truly. When you put the data together, you can actually find novel tumor suppressor gene damage as well. So here's a cluster of dozens, if not a hundred, different structural variant breakpoints damaging a locus that happened to create an in-frame, well, it happened to damage P53 and SUS12, which is an important epigenetic regulator, also a tumor suppressor gene. In this case, P53, the expression level went extremely low, which supports that this was a damaging mutation. and um, and help to explain this particular case in a way that, that would have been hard to do otherwise. One of the things that we did that was a bit different is we reported outlier genes, so genes with expression levels that were, were aberrant. And interestingly, in 77% of these genes, there was not an underlying copy number change. So in the top left, you see genes that are down-regulated and had a copy number deletion. And in the bottom right, the blue ones are over-expressed and amplified, but the red dots really were only uh, overexpressed. And some of these um, overexpressed genes led to treatment recommendations that had a big clinical impact. One example that we like to talk about is on the right, where a patient had extremely high levels of REB, R-H-E-B. We know that um, this was in a rare uh, France tumor, a pancreatic tumor. And so we know that these tumors are often driven by beta-catenin. This high level of REB expression we proposed was going to lead to overactivated mTORC signaling and the pathway analysis confirmed that. We made the treatment recommendation for an mTOR inhibitor and the patient had a complete response after two months. This is a great example. I can't say we know the answers and how to match patients to drugs based on gene expression outliers all the time. I'm still trying to work out what those rules might be. One of the other really powerful things when you put genome and RNA sequencing data together is, is understanding splice altering variants. So here we've got a, a G to an A mutation at the fifth base in the intron. This is a pretty tricky base to call as being pathogenic unless you had the RNA sequencing data and could see that this mutation caused exon skipping in this particular patient and that exon skipping had almost never been seen in a whole cohort of, of tissue match controls. So in our paper, we found 28 pathogenic splice altering variants. Nine of those were at non-canonical sites like these, which would otherwise have been hard to call without bringing these data together. If we turn our attention to the germline for a moment, I've just been talking about the tumor to date, but 16% of the patients had a genetic change that we found in their germline, which passed clinical genetics review to be returned back to the patient as being you know, clinically important for their cancer risk. If we compare that to the previous largest study by the St. Jude group, that was around 8.5%. And so the comprehensiveness of the approach and the discovery of a number of new cancer predisposition genes has helped uh, drive this rate up to 16%. You often think of cancer risk in families which, which have lots of cancer in them, but what was remarkable is that the variant was known to the family in only 35% of cases and it was actually known to the patient in less than 30%. So this suggests that it's really important to look in the germline, even when there isn't a classical inheritance pattern in that family that suggests there may be a cancer predisposition allele. This obviously has an important impact on, uh, on other at-risk individuals in the family. In 5% of patients, the 13 patients, we took, them, took the data together and changed the diagnosis. Uh, sometimes that was making it a more precise diagnosis. Sometimes it changed it completely. Um, whether it was the, gene ex the, the mutational profile, a gene expression classifier, which in this case said the, the tumor was most likely a radiation-induced glioma, a relapse, so a different tumor, not, not a relapse of the original tumor, or whether the methylation arrays supported a change of diagnosis. 
So this is obviously really important for treating each patient properly. And so in summary, when we put together the single nucleotide changes, the indels, copy number, structural variations and fusions, we found a potentially targetable finding in 71% of the cohort. So if we were to summarise again, the, the rates that 94% sub reportable, 71% with a treatment recommendation. This, this compares really favourably to a, a table of different studies that are, are doing similar types of precision medicine at the national or, or large institutional scale, and that the actionable rates from putting these types of data together is, is far higher than, than is typically observed. If we consider each patient uh, or each platform, then each patient here is a column in this particular plot down here. And we see that in many patients, there are many reportable findings, often from a range of different platforms. So the red is from the genome and the RNA-seq. Blue is from whole genome only. Pink or salmon is from RNA only. And so what this is telling us is that you need to be applying a range of platforms to try and uh, find this information about each patient and that there is no one best platform in our, in our experience so far and that doing both of these approaches and the methylation profiling has been really uh, beneficial for, for this type of precision medicine. If we skip quickly through the clinical responses, if we look at the first 38 patients on targeted treatments, 71% of these patients had a complete response or a partial response or a stabilization of their otherwise aggressive disease. Some of these stable stabilizations of disease were extremely durable. Uh, th six patients more than 24 weeks. And what was interesting is we try and make a confidence or a tier of recommendation and the tier doesn't seem to make much difference. Our, our best responding patient had a lowest tier four evidence and some of the tier one patients didn't actually do particularly well. So I think we have some work to do to try and work out how best to present these treatment recommendations. And the tiers relate to how much literature evidence there is supporting it. Um, so I think we have more to do there. Finally, for the 28 patients where we can measure the, the, the tumor before and after, lots of um, shrinkage of, of those particular tumors. Again, didn't really matter what the tier of the recommendation was. In the interest of time, I'm gonna skip this final example. So the last bit of the talk is really going to be what's coming forward and, and hints more to the title of increasing the precision, precision medicine. Studies like Zero today work on a single tissue biopsy and that's likely to underrepresent the intratumoral heterogeneity. We make treatment recommendations based on that single biopsy, which means we might be missing uh, recommendations from different biopsy, from different yeah, biopsies, metastatic lesions. We lack methods to track patients and see how they're doing on, on their therapies, the precision medicine therapies. It's harder to spot the emergence of subclones, which might have completely different genetics and completely different targetable mutations. And often, particularly in brain cancers, repeat biopsy is neither practical or ethical. Um, of, of course, liquid biopsy is the potential solution here, and there's still questions about, particularly for brain cancers, should we look at the plasma or the CSF? And so liquid biopsy has the potential to, to address many of these limitations. Um, and so really what we're trying to do, and we've established the, the Childhood Cancer Liquid Biopsy Program funded by, by the Australian Cancer Research Foundation, which is that if we consider four different patients at diagnosis, all with considerable disease burden, treated in the initial phase through liquid biopsy, we're hoping to identify the patients that are disease free, late relapse, early relapse, or refractory as soon as possible so that we can change their treatment and hopefully improve their, um, their health up outcomes. So the research goals of this program are to identify patients at high risk of early relapse, understand how these tumors evolve, and really answer some questions about whether liquid biopsy improves outcomes in kids, especially with solid tumors, because as I mentioned, they otherwise don't have um, any, other any other methods for monitoring them. This is, I'm very pleased to say, in partnership with TWIST, who's going to help us with our um, targeted sequencing approach for, for, uh, for developing this program. Some of the specific challenges that we need to overcome are that there is a low mutation burden in many of these children, so we need a more personalised approach. There's lots of structural variants, as I've already mentioned, so we need to think about clever ways of picking up those from the RNA, perhaps, 
and that children's cancers are driven by different genes to adult cancers, which reinforces the need for a bespoke approach specifically for children. The final one is the big picture of how do we put all this data together, the molecular data, in vitro, in vivo, and clinical data, so that ultimately we can have each patient or each model improve the outcomes for the next patient that comes through with de developing a learning model, um, which tries to overcome the fact that some of the data is locked in silos in the hospital, and then some of the data is, is scattered at lots of different research environments. This is gonna be a big challenge, uh, but something we're trying to work on. So the take home messages are that kids are not small adults, their cancers, mutations, and treatments are different. Comprehensive multimodal molecular profiling reveals substantial tumor genetic heterogeneity. D data integration is a powerful approach, and we've not, we found that there's no one best modality. But when you do and put it all together, there's very high diagnostic and therapeutic utility for these children. I've shown you examples of precision medicine already improving health outcomes but there are still many undruggable targets. Some of these are very specific, and that's a typo, EW, SR1, P53, and MYC uh, come to mind as really important pediatric cancer drivers. The next phase of the Zero Childhood Cancer Program will see all children, adolescents, and young adults being eligible by 2023, which is extremely exciting, and that we're scaling out a personalized liquid biopsy program so that we can monitor these patients as they, as they progress. And if we're thinking really big, we're rewriting the future. We need to consider the genomics in the whole of life care, from the pre-womb all the way to the tomb. And I focus today only on cancer diagnosis, but as you can see, there's, there's a whole range of applications where genomics is, is already having a huge impact on, um, on patient care. So I'd like to thank all my colleagues from the Zero Childhood Cancer Program, especially Vanessa Tyrrell, the, the program leader. I, very large number of supporters who we could not do what we do without you. Uh, thank you very much. And to my group, uh, the Computational Biology Group at the Children's Cancer Institute. Uh, now about 16 strong and um, a great group to be working with of staff and students and um, commercial partners, uh, especially TWIST. Uh, again, thank you for this invitation.